Okay, so moving on to chapter three, we're now on to motion in two or more dimensions. Mostly we're going to be looking at motion in the plane uh, as opposed to we've been looking mostly at motion uh, on a line. And now we're going to look at motion in the plane. But you could look at motion in, uh, you know, in three dimensions or even more, you know, uh, but typically we break break our motion down into a plane. That's the X, Y plane. And there's not a whole lot to say about this subject, but there's a couple of important points. But a lot of this, a lot of uh, this subject is really just about keeping things straight. So it's really important to, you know, keep things straight. And uh, when we say keep things straight, we mean, you know, uh, the things that we're talking about are our components of vectors. Uh, and the big thing that you have to realize uh, is that the X and Y components of a vector are independent of each other. independent of each other. So what happens in X doesn't affect Y and vice versa. But what happens in X or Y does affect the resultant. And in case you forgot, the resultant is the sum of the components or any vectors. So, I mean, in a way, that's kind of everything, but, uh, We'll give a, a couple of, uh, you know, sort of examples here. All right, like if we have some vector here like this, right? If that's a vector, that vector has some components, right? So if this was called, vector, if this was vector A, for example, right, if this was vector A, vector A has some components like that. That would be AX and then there would be an AY component like that. So that would be component AX and that would be AY. And we could and Remember, we really have these, we have these i hat and these j hat directions. So we could express vector A like this as having some AX in the i hat direction plus some AY in the j hat direction. And then if we had another vector, we could call it maybe vector B, for example, right? If there was a vector B, maybe like in that direction there, okay? And this is vector B. Well, vector B could have some components, maybe like this, and maybe like this. And we could call these components, you know, BX in the I hat direction and B, Y in the J hat direction, right? And so vector B would have these components, uh, not A, B, X, I hat plus B, Y in the J hat direction. And so if we wanted to find the sum of these vectors, right? If we said uh, A hat, A vector plus B vector, Right, 
Well, that would be what we call the resultant or the sum of those vectors. We would say it's AX plus BX I hat plus a y plus b y in the j hat direction. And graphically, you would add them up by um, by you know, using like the tip to tail method. So something like, trying to see if I can uh, select this item here and then maybe copy it, but I guess you can't here. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to um, do my best to say, all right, well, so that's like, that's vector B again, like that. And that's vector A, like that. And then that would mean that our resultant would look something like that. There's our resultant. <clears throat> um, and you could, of course, find the magnitude of your resultant, right? The magnitude of your, whoops, wrong tool, right? The magnitude of our resultant would be the square root of rx squared plus ry squared, where this is rx, and that's ry. And then theta r is the inverse tangent of ry over rx. Um, and as we see, like the, the resultant, right, that vector A is affected by both vector, by, by both component X and component Y. And R is, convicted by, is affected by both component X and component Y. But the X components are not affected by the Y components, right? The Y components stay with the Y components, the X components stay with the X components, and they just, they don't intermix with each other. So that's really why they are they're independent. Um, and this is going to become really important with projectile motion because the acceleration is only in the vertical direction. And what happens in the vertical direction doesn't affect the horizontal direction. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the main point of this all. But, you know, you see, once you start practicing it, there's a lot of details and it can be difficult to keep everything straight. So... Um, it's really important to just know what components you're talking about. Um, in general, right, if you have some vector A, that if you have some vector A, then AX is typically given by vector A times the cosine of theta, and AY is given by A times the sine of theta, but this is only true assuming that the angle, here, yeah, maybe I should, this is only true assuming that the angle is um, with respect, right? Assuming that the angle is with respect to the positive x direction. Right? It's the opposite if the angle is with respect to the positive y direction. That switches it around, right? So when, remember, when we take the cosine, what we're really saying, right, is, um, right, remember, cosine theta and sine theta, like, what do they actually pick out, right? 
cosine theta picks out the adjacent piece, which is usually the x piece, but not always. And sine theta picks out the opposite piece, which is usually the y piece, but not always. It depends on how you set things up. Um, and finally, something to know when, when you're dealing with relative motion, um, that you often can add up velocities. So, um, there's this topic of, um, relative motion. So all motion is relative to something. Uh, but generally, it's usually the ground or earth. But sometimes there is a medium in between. For example, the air or the water. So if something is moving in the water or air and the air and water or the air or water is also moving, the velocity relative to the ground is the sum the, which maybe say the vector sum of the velocities. So if you have, for example, um, an airplane moving through the air, right? The velocity of the airplane with respect to the ground is going to be equal to the velocity of the airplane with respect to the air plus the air with respect to the ground. So for example, This could be the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. And this could be the velocity, this, this vector here, right, B, this could be the velocity of the air with respect to the ground, right? That's the same vector, velocity of the air with respect to the ground, right? So the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground would be the velocity of the plane with respect to the air plus the velocity of the air with respect to the ground. And you might notice that when you add these two things up, right, these, this, this thing, if, if there's this sort of sequence, those two things kind of uh, cancel, they don't cancel really, but that gives us this plane with respect to the ground. The plane to the air plus the air to the ground is the plane to the ground. Um, and that's uh, something that's going to come up a lot as we as we practice things. Um, if you have, um, I, I guess one last thing is, if you have uh, a vector with components like this, you could take the derivative of it. So for example, um, so one last thing, if you have some vector, like some vector r, like and and positions are often given with an r, so r could have some r some x component in the i hat direction plus some y component in the j hat direction, or it might just be given like this x i hat plus y j hat. So if that's vector r, well we could say the derivative of vector r, right, is going to be the derivative of x with respect to time in the i hat direction plus the derivative of y with respect to time in the j hat direction, right? We just differentiate each of these. And this would be, whoops, the uh, y, y. So this would be the x velocity in the i hat direction plus the y velocity in the j hat direction. So um, 
there's not that much more to add, although there's a whole, we'll talk about projectiles, um, but uh, there's not that much really to keep in mind other than that the vectors are independent and you can only add, you got to keep the X pieces with the X pieces, the Y pieces with the Y pieces. If there was another piece, you know, if there was a Z piece, you'd have to keep those together. And each individual piece affects the resultant, but the individual pieces don't affect each other. And then we just have to really keep our uh, our SIGN signs, um, you know, straight. We got to know which which direction is positive and which direction is negative. We have to understand what we're taking angles with respect to. But that's really, in a way, that's there's that's kind of all there is to it. Um, but we just have to keep our uh, apply our rules for motion, you know, in a systematic uh, and methodical way. And we're gonna look at some examples. Of those, so I'm gonna um, uh, present uh, uh, three different problems here, and uh, you can follow along uh, with some of those examples. This is a fairly straightforward problem, but it's a, a great example, and you can see how some of these things—they're not conceptually difficult, but there's just a lot of things to keep straight. Uh, and it's always good to have diagrams and make choices about these things. So. There's a swiftly moving hawk moving due west with a speed of three meters a second. So due west would be like that, All right? So that is our initial velocity, which is uh, 30 meters a second. And we'll worry about the SIGN sign in a minute. And then five seconds later, it's moving due north with a speed of 20 meters a second. So a little bit later, it's got this speed or this velocity here to be more precise. A little bit later, it's like that, all right? And we could call that Twenty meters a second. And what is the magnitude and direction of delta V during this five second interval? And what are the magnitude and direction of A? All right. Uh, so there are different ways to think about this. Um, first of all, it's always good to pick a coordinate system. So we have to decide what directions do we want to call positive directions, okay? So you could call, um, we can go with positive directions, we can go with negative directions, all right? Uh, or we can, we can go with pot conventions, traditional sign conventions, or with unusual sign conventions, okay? Um, it's really, you know, a, a question of how you want to set things up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, let's just call this the positive X direction, and we'll call that the positive Y direction. Let's call everything positive. A lot of people like to call to the right positive, and that's fine. Then we could call this direction, that would, be, that, that would make this a negative value. I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's keep everything positive. So um, first question A, what are the magnitude and direction of delta V, all right? So if we wanna find delta V, right? Delta V is just V minus V initial, okay? But now what we have to do is really keep these things straight. So the best way to, what we really need to do is, uh, think about what the unit vectors are, right? So really, V is not just 20 or 20 meters a second, it's 20 meters per second in the J hat direction. And V initial is not just 30 meters a second, it's 30 meters per second in the I hat direction.
right? Uh, if we called the other, if we called to the east the positive direction, then this would have to be negative. Okay. And so really, when we say we want to find out delta V, right? What's delta V? Well, it's going to be 20 meters a second J hat minus 30 meters a second I hat. And the thing you got to keep in mind is that the components, the X and Y components are completely independent, right? The, what happens in the X direction doesn't affect what happens in the Y direction. What happens in the Y direction does not affect what happens in the X direction. Now, each of them together affects the resultant, but uh, together, but e the X and Y things do not affect each other. So a great way to think about this, we could think about this in terms of vector addition, right? And when we say delta V, delta V is V final minus V initial. So that would really, if we want to sort of reformulate this in terms of vectors, right? It would be, we would have our V final, which is like that. And then we would have to add the opposite of the initial like that, right? And this would be, this vector is, that is V, and this vector here is negative V initial. And so then we can add them up and the resultant of the two is like that. That's our resultant vector, right? And so what has to happen if we, and if we look at this, maybe it, I don't know if it'll, hopefully it seems clear, right? Our resultant has an X piece and a Y piece. So you'll notice what is the change, the change in the, this, these red vectors, these are the changes in velocity. Right, the black vectors here. These are this is the initial velocity. This is the final velocity, and this vector that's the change in the velocity. So the change in the velocity meant we had to completely cancel out the initial velocity, right? The because the x the initial velocity was all in the x direction. So we had to create an x vector that was just as big as our initial vector, but in the opposite direction in order to cancel out all this horizontal velocity. And then we had to create 20 meters a second of Y velocity. We had to create that. So that's why this is delta V, right? That's why that's what this vector here is delta V. So I hope that creates some sort of maybe conceptual or visual intuition, which is really important to have. Um, and hopefully you can see, right, what is what is this, right? That, that this is, that this would be negative 20 meters a second, or negative, whoops, not negative 20, right? It's negative 30 meters a second. And this is that positive 20 meters a second. And this is negative because we called, I called to the left positive. If you'd done the opposite, then, then this would have been negative and this would be positive. All right. So I'm going through this very slowly, but I'm trying to explain it in detail. So what is the magnitude? Now, the question is, what are the magnitudes and direction of delta V? So what we're trying to find out is what is the length of this vector, the magnitude. So we can say we have the components of delta V, right? We have it in unit vector form, but what we want to know now is what is this? What is the magnitude of delta V, the length of that? Well, the length of this is just the square root of the sum of the squares, right? It's just like the Pythagorean theorem. So that's going to be 20 
squared plus negative 30 squared. And I could have included meters per second here and meters per second here. And when you square, it's going to be meters squared per second squared. But when you square root it, it's just meters per second. So this is going to be square root of, that's 400 plus 900 meters per second, which gives us a magnitude of delta V that is equal to square root 1300 meters per second, which is uh, 130 times 10 or thir 13 times 100, right? 13, so that's going to be 10 root 13 meters per second, or on a calculator, um, that is. Thirty-six meters per second. So that's our magnitude, but we also need the direction. Right here, I'll, that's the magnitude, and we also need the direction. What would the direction of this delta v be? Well, we can just say theta is the inverse tangent of whatever the change in y over the change in x is. So that was twenty over thirty. Now, Uh, I did this negative here, I was all, so I'll go ahead and stay with that. But you have to really think about what these negatives mean, okay? You can't um, go on autopilot. It's very important that you keep in mind what the negatives actually represent. Remember, in this case, negative represents negative 30, represents 30 to the right, not 30 to the left. So in any case, that's tangent inverse of two thirds. So we go ahead, go ahead and do that. And tangent inverse of two thirds is that is 33.7 degrees. Um, Now, if you did this with the negative, right, then you're, of course, you're going to get a negative here. But remember, that's really still going like this direction here. So this hopefully um that's clear right so what is this this is really right about so at significant digits it's 34 degrees right 34 degrees but it's it's 34 degrees in this direction that is that is negative 34 in this case is in this case negative 34 would be the counterclockwise direction, the standard direction. So if we if we had gone with more convention of conventional coordinates here, called to the right positive, this might have been easier. Um, sometimes when you start dealing with um, calculating angles, it's best to stick with conventional coordinates when you start calculating angles. But you just got to sort of think about what these things mean. So moving onwards.
right? What is the magnitude and direction of the average acceleration during this five second interval? Well, the acceleration um, would just be the delta V over delta T, right? A equals delta V over T. So we could say, we could get the um, average, right? That means that A or A bar, average acceleration, that would be 20 meters per second J hat minus 30 meters per second I hat, negative being to the right, okay, using this convention, right? This is the negative direction using our convention divided by five seconds. So that would give us, right? 20 divided by five would be four, meters per second squared, J hat minus 30 over five would be six meters per second squared, I hat, uh, which actually probably most people do, do the I hat than J, J hat first. So negative six, I hat plus four, J hat and it's all meters per second squared. So then if we want to find the magnitude of that, it's going to be the square root of negative six squared plus four squared meters per second squared, which is, of course, square root of that's 36 plus 16 meters per second squared. And 36 plus 16, that is root 42. Uh, so square root of 42 And that comes out to be about 6.48 or 6.5 meters per second squared. So that's the magnitude of the acceleration. And then what is the angle? Well, theta is still tangent inverse of the y component over the x component, which is four over six, or that's the same as uh, the two over three. So it's the same exact angle as the angle of the change in velocity, which it should be, right? Because the change in velocity over the time is the acceleration. So it should point the same direction. It just doesn't have the same magnitude. Um, and if we want to be really precise, right, we could put that negative there. Um, actually, the negative goes, um, yeah, it goes there. That, that was the right place. Okay, so um, so the same same value, that uh, 34 degrees, this direction, 34 degrees that way, 34 degrees north of east would be the angle. Okay, uh, I hope that is uh, clear. Uh, hopefully this, hopefully that's something you can do faster than the way I did it. Um, but I wanted to go through it slowly so people would be able to understand what's going on. So uh, here we're given another position vector, um, and this position vector uh, has a, an I component with a linear function of T and a J component 
with a quadratic function of t. It's got a linear term and a quadratic term. Um, and hopefully you can see what, is, what does this basically mean? Um, well, it means our x position, our, our x values, our horizontal values have a constant velocity, right? And the y ones have a, 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 a constant acceleration with an initial velocity. That's the initial velocity. And then this is basically the acceleration due to gravity, right? One half of G, one half of, of 10 would be five. So it says to find the instantaneous velocity and instantaneous acceleration vectors as functions of time T. So there's uh, there's like the really straightforward way to do this. So let's go ahead and kind of do the uh, sort of rigorous method of this here. And, uh, and then at the end, we'll sort of think about it again, sort of what it means, right? So if we want to find the velocity, right? Well, what the velocity is, it's the derivative with respect to time of the position function, which in this case is r. So that's just going to be the derivative with respect to time of all of this, 30 t i hat plus 40 t minus 5 t squared. That's all together. That's j hat. Okay. Well, differentiating this is fairly straightforward, right? <clears throat> we just differentiate. So the derivative of 30 t, it's just going to be 30. in the i hat direction plus the derivative of 40t is just going to be 40 minus the derivative of 5t squared is we're going to pull down that 2 so 2 times 5 is 10t and that's all in the j hat direction so there's the velocity vector um, and hopefully you see, right, what does this mean? Well, this means that there's a constant velocity of 30 in the i hat direction and an initial velocity of 40 in the j hat direction with an acceleration of negative 10 in the j hat direction. So that means um, this is sort of like it had initial velocity of like 40 up, but an acceleration of 10 down. So that means like after four seconds, it's going to change direction. You know, that's sort of the wisdom of this. And then uh, we could go ahead and calculate the acceleration. Well, what's the acceleration? That's going to be just the derivative with respect to time of V. So that's just DDT of this function, 30 I hat plus 40 minus 10 T J hat. Okay. Well, the derivative of 30, this is just a constant. So that's just going to be zero plus the derivative of 40, 40 J hat. That's just a constant again. So that's going to be another zero minus 10 T. Well, that's just going to be 10. Uh, and that's J hat. I mean, if you wanted to, this would be an I, we could put an I hat there and a J hat there, but it's really not necessary, of course, when you're multiplying by zero. So this becomes just negative 10 J hat. So there's your acceleration. It's just negative 10 J hat. Uh, but remember, we really could sort of see that from this, right? This was really like saying, Right, this this r vector here. Right, basically we're saying, well, there was an r x. The x component of our position was given by thirty t, and the y component of our position was given by 
40t minus 5t squared. So this was like v initial in the x direction times t, and there was no acceleration term, right? It's like saying plus one half ax t squared, but that ax was zero. So it just came out like this. And then ry, this was like saying, this is like the y initial t, that was our initial y velocity, minus one half a t squared. And this one half a is five. Um, or we could have we could have said plus if we want to plus and then we see that the acceleration was negative 10 right one half a was negative five right one half a is negative five meaning a was negative 10. so hopefully uh some of that seems uh like a, a good correlation uh, but we can sort of show those things rigorously the way we did uh, but we also should have some intuition about it like this. Okay. Okay. So here's another relative velocity problem, but now we have um, motion in two dimensions. And it's really important when you're doing these types of problems to uh, create a good diagram. Um, not just because it's some arbitrary thing we say you have to do. If you can draw a diagram, you probably have some understanding of what's going on. And if you can't diagram it, it probably means you don't fully understand what's happening in the scenario. So it's important. Drawing the diagram is part of how you gain an understanding of what is actually happening. And although these seem like they're just math problems, uh, you know, which they are in some ways, it's really the, the physics is really in the setup. So we have this plane that flies at this speed, 250 kilometers an hour, uh, but we don't know in what direction. And it says a wind is blowing 80 kilometers towards the direction, 60 degrees east of north. So first of all, let's draw uh, like a coordinate system, okay? So, in fact, actually, let's go ahead and um, so here's like a coordinate system, and actually, here we'll make it a little give ourselves a little more room here. Like that. So there's our coordinate system, and we have our wind that is blowing 80 kilometers an hour towards the direction 60 degrees east of north. So here's the important thing. Right, it's 60 degrees east of north, like this. That's the that is 60 degrees east of north. Um, and bearings for planes and things like that, navigational bearings, they're often given, relative. They're, they're usually given relative to north. But in a lot of physics problems, when we set up coordinate systems, we often set up our directions relative to east. Of course, you can set them relative to anything you want, as long as you keep things straight. But you have to think that if you make this angle, if we say it's 30 degrees, right? That's 60 degrees. This would be east of north. This would be 30 degrees north of east, right? If we're saying relative to east, then the cosine picks out the x component and the sine picks out the y component, which is the standard convention we use most of the time. If you do this, right, if we go east of north, then cosine is going to pick out the y component, the vertical piece, and sine will pick out 
the um, uh, uh, sign will pick out the horizontal piece, the X piece, like that. So um, it's just important to know, right, the definition of trig functions, that cosine doesn't pick out the X piece and sine doesn't pick out the Y piece. Cosine picks out the adjacent piece and sine picks out the opposite piece. And in our conventional coordinates, the opposite piece is the Y piece and the adjacent piece is the X piece. But if you did it like this, relative, if, you, if you use your angle relative to north, then the adjacent piece is the Y piece and the opposite piece is the X piece. So either one is fine. I'm going to go ahead and say, we're gonna work with this 30 degree angle, relative what it is relative to north, right? So instead of 30 degrees east of north, instead of, sorry, 60 degrees east of north, I'm gonna say 30 degrees north of east, all right? So this is the velocity of the wind, all right? And we could say it's the velocity of the wind with respect to the ground, okay? Um, you, or you could say the air with respect to the ground if you want. And we could even say VWG is, that's that 80 kilometers per hour value. Um, so in what direction should the plane head in order to fly due north relative to the ground, okay? So what we want, what we want is to have the plane end up going due north. we want it to do something like this, okay? We want that plane to go due north. Um, and it's not even, we don't even necessarily say, want it, don't even really care how fast it goes due north. We just want it to end up going due north relative to the ground, okay? So we want it to head this way. Um, all right, but we don't know exactly how fast. So what can we do to get it to go that way? Well, the plane itself is gonna have to go somewhere in this direction. It's gonna have to head off somewhere west of north. It's gonna have to have some velocity west of north, ultimately, or if we're going from east, it's gonna to have to have a, an angle of greater than 90 from east because it has to have a sufficient velocity, a sufficient speed, but sufficient X velocity in order to cancel out the X component, okay? Uh, and we know that it's gonna have, it's, it's got a speed that's, um, at 250, that is, is almost, that's a little over three times the speed of the velocity of the wind. So something like that. So that is like the velocity of the plane. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. That's like the velocity of the plane. Huh. That's the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind. And hopefully you see that there's going to be a component of that motion that's like this, and a component of that motion that's like this. Excuse me, I don't know why I am, I've got a little cold and I'm sneezing a lot here. Uh, so 
there's going to be these components of the plane's motion. And there are these components of the wind's motion. Like that. And so hopefully what you see here is those horizontal components are going to cancel out. That's what we're trying to get to have happen. And then those vertical pieces, they add up. All right, so these pieces, they're going to add up like that. And that is going to be the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground. So now <laughs> it is flying due north. And this is the value we're trying to find. So what we got to know is basically what this angle is here. Okay, what well, that's the direction we're trying to figure out. All right, so basically there's this angle here and this angle here. And we're adding up these two vectors. So basically this vector plus this vector is gonna equal that. So we could express the vector equation, right? The velocity of the plane with respect to the wind plus the velocity of the wind with respect to the ground is gonna equal the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground. And these are vector equations. And the thing to keep in mind is that the components of the vectors are independent of each other, right? So we can add up each of the, we can add up the directions and treat the directions as scalars. Um, with just a positive or a negative sign, right? We can't add these numbers up because these are not scalars. These are vectors with directions, right? They have some components, right? The plane with respect to the wind has an X component and a Y component. And the wind with respect to the ground has an X component and a Y component. All right, so we can't just add up numbers, right? But we can add up the numbers of the components in the X and Y direction. So the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind in the X direction plus the velocity of the wind with respect to the ground in the X direction, that equals the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground in the x direction, which that's this, that's the that value there. We know that is zero. So the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind, right? That's going to be V P W times the cosine of or times times the we're looking at this we're trying to get this x piece here right so the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind it's if we're using this angle here right we would be looking at the sine piece and if we looked at this entire angle here then we could pick the cosine piece so it depends on, on what we do here but i'm i'm going to say we are looking at this angle here so in fact that is sine theta, right? We're, we're trying to figure out this, this piece right here, right? It's the same, it would be the same value as that vector right there, right? We can just translate it up and down. Like that. 
and we're trying to find this length, right? This piece is opposite that piece. So that's a sine piece. Even though it's even though it's a horizontal piece, right? It's opposite this angle because this angle is relative to the y axis, not relative to the x axis. And then we're going to say, and it's also going to be in the negative direction. So there would be a negative there because it's in the negative direction pointing that way. So the wind with respect to the ground, that is going to be V W G cosine 30 degrees, or you could say sine 60 or cosine 30 equals zero. And so what we want to do is find this theta. So we can add it over, right? So V P W sine theta equals V W G cosine 30 degrees. And then we can isolate sine theta. So sine theta equals V W G cosine theta over V P W. Um, where whoops, that, that cosine, that should be cosine 30, right? And then we just need to take the inverse sine to get this angle. So VWG is 80 kilometers an hour. Cosine 30 is going to be root 3 over 2. And V plane with respect to wind is 250. Kilometers an hour. Kilometers per hour cancels, and we can cancel 10, and that just gives us, uh, and then we can cancel an 8 and a 2. So that's going to give us just a 4. So that gives us 4 root 3 over 25. And then we can say theta is going to be the inverse sine of that value, 4 root 3 over 25. And you can do that on a calculator. So what does that come out to be? And I get um, about 16 degrees here. So then we're left calculating what and so that that's this angle here. That's that 16 degree angle. So then we're left, what is the speed of the plane relative to the ground? Well, the speed of the plane is entirely in the y direction. So we're basically trying to add up this piece plus that piece. So we're basically adding up the y, the, the y pieces here. So the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind in the y direction plus the velocity of the wind with respect to the ground in the y direction equals the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground in the y direction. So we, now, we know the velocity of the plane with respect to the wind, that's going to be 
it's 80. Um, I'm sorry, the plane is um, 250 kilometers per hour. Uh, and when that's going to be the sign of this angle. That's the, times the sign of this uh, function here, which was 16 degrees or, oh uh, no, sorry, the cosine. Sorry. The co would be this because we're looking for this, the cosine of that 16 degrees. plus this piece here v so that's going to be the 80 kilometers an hour times the sine of 30 degrees um so that's going to be 40 right? Sine 30 is just one half. And then this, right, we have to take the cosine of that angle, 16.0888, or just 16, right? So, um, but if you got us on your calculator, we can do that. So 16 degrees times 250 plus 40. And that gives us um this this value here is 240.3 kilometers an hour so you add those up and it gives you 280 kilometers an hour so that is the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground now it's in the y direction but the entire velocity is only, the, there is no velocity in the x direction. That's the whole thing we tried to calculate. We were trying to say, what angle does it fly in order to fly due north? So we don't need to add up the x component and the y component in quadrature, right? This is the velocity of the plane. Okay, this is a fairly classic example of relative motion. It's only in one dimension, but hopefully it will help illustrate some concepts. So what we have here is uh, like a river. And on that river, there are a couple of docks. Um, and it's like, there's one of the docks, there's the other dock. And the two docks are separated by some distance, delta x. And that delta x in this case is two kilometers. And the water is flowing some direction. Uh, why don't we say it's to the east, you know, to the right in this picture? So the velocity of the water with respect to the ground or the earth is 1.4 kilometers per hour. So like that, that's the velocity of the water with respect to the ground and in the water, there's a boat. And the boat travels downstream and then back upstream. And what we want to know is the velocity of that boat. That's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, we know the velocity of the water, but we don't know the velocity of the boat. And we know the total time that it takes for the round trip is 50 minutes. 
and we want to find the speed of the boat relative to the water, right? So the velocity of the boat with respect to the water, right? Now, <clears throat> the ultimate speed of the boat with respect to the ground, right? the velocity of the boat with respect to the ground, that's going to be the velocity of the boat with respect to the water plus or minus the velocity of the water with respect to the ground. And if, if you'll notice, right, when you are adding up relative velocities like this, this, like with the boat with respect to the ground, it's the boat to the water plus or minus the water to the ground. And it depends if you're going upstream or downstream, right? So the velocity of the boat upstream is going to be the boat to the water minus the water to the ground. And the velocity downstream that's going to be the velocity of the boat with respect to the water plus the water to the ground, right? So when you go upstream, you're going to go a little slower because the water is pushing against you. When you go downstream, you're going to go a little faster because the water is pushing you forward. You're gaining that speed. Okay. Now, overall, the definition of any sort of velocity is right displacement over time or any speed. We're really talking about speeds here. Um, so the thing we've got going on here is, of course, that these we've got this upstream and this downstream. Okay. Uh, so the velocity um right the the velocity um upstream that's going to be this v bw minus VWG, and that's going to equal delta X over the time it takes us to go upstream. And if we look at this problem, right, what we have here are um, two unknowns, right? We don't know this time it takes us to go upstream. And we don't know the velocity of the boat with respect to the water. Uh, now, what if we do the velocity going downstream? Well, it's the exact same equation, the velocity with the boat with respect to the water plus the velocity of the water with respect to the ground. And that equals delta x over t downstream. But now we have actually added a third unknown, right? Now we have not only the velocity of the boat with respect to the water and the time upstream, we've also got the time downstream. So that's now three unknowns. So we haven't really helped us out because we have still uh, one more unknown than equation, but there's a third clincher we have, which is what, what happens in a lot of these situations, right? We don't know the time of either leg, but we know the total time. So the time upstream plus the time downstream equals the total time. And that's the real clincher because we can solve for time in both of these first two equations here, and we can plug those values into this statement here. 
and then it will be a uh, equation with one unknown, just these boat to water unknowns, right? So we're going to eliminate these two times. But right now, if you look at this, this you should understand this is solvable, right? Because it's three equations and three unknowns. So that's what makes this solvable. All right. So there's different ways to go about solving it. Uh, some ways are lengthier than others, but hopefully you understand that that is now a solvable system. And even though it can look a little chaotic, it's just three linear equations, right? So it's just a, a system of linear equations. So let's take this expression here, right? T upstream plus T downstream equals T total. We want to express these things here, these times upstream and downstream. Uh, so time upstream, right? I'm going to isolate that. That's going to be delta x over vbw minus vwg. And time downstream is going to be delta x over VBW plus VWG. And notice, right, there's the same delta X on top, right? Think about what's going on. For the upstream, the denominator is going to be smaller. Smaller denominator means larger value. So this time is going to be larger, right? When we're going against the current, it's going to take us more time to complete that leg of the trip to go that distance, delta x. And when we're going downstream, right, these two things are going to add up. We're going to get a bigger value in the denominator, which is going to make the total value smaller, which means it takes less time to go that leg of the journey, that distance. So these times can just be plugged in for upstream and downstream. So now we've got delta x over v v w minus v w g plus v v w plus v w g that's on the bottom times delta x equals t total. And now we have just one unknown, right? The only unknown is this velocity of the boat with respect to the water, speed with the boat with respect to the water. And that's the thing we're really trying to figure out. And we know delta x, we know the speed of the water, and we know this total time. So it's now just a matter of isolating this. And the easiest thing to do is to multiply both sides by the product of these two, all right? So I'm going to write it, I'm going to put the whole equation in parentheses and write V, V, W minus V, W, G times V, B, W plus V, W, G like that, and we're multiplying both sides of the equation by this product. And hopefully you see, of course, that it's difference of perfect squares. So when we multiply this term here, right, the difference, the negative uh, product, the, or the negative factor is gonna cancel. This is gonna cancel with that. So that's gonna give us, delta x times the remainder, the, re the remaining factor, the sum v b w plus v w g plus delta x times the, in this in this one here, when we multiply these two together, we're going to cancel the sum factor. 
right? That factor is gonna cancel. I'm gonna be left with just this one, the difference. So VBW minus VWG equals TT times, when we do this distribution here, it's difference of perfect squares. So the cross terms are gonna be canceled and it's gonna be just VBW squared minus VWG squared. And uh, we can go ahead and uh, take a look at this, right? We're gonna have these VBWs, those are gonna add up, right? These two, those are gonna add up, but these two, the water with respect to the ground, those are going to cancel. So we're gonna be left with delta X, there's gonna be two VBWs equals, we're gonna have a T, T times VBW squared minus VWG squared. Let's divide out that TT term. And we're gonna be left with two delta X over TT VBW equals VBW squared minus VWG squared. Let's move everything over to one side. VBW squared minus two delta X over T, T minus VWG squared equals zero. And hopefully you see that this is a quadratic. Now you might say, well, aren't there two quadratics? Remember the water with respect to the ground, that's this, we know that value. The um, thing we're trying to solve for is, um, oh, I, I left out, of course, uh, let's, left out something, right, that there's V, VW there, right? Yeah. Right, this, this was this term, we moved that term over to the other side, I forgot to include the VBW there. So this is the quadratic term, the quadratic, this is a quadratic uh, equation here of BBW, which is the thing we're trying to solve. So you can do it on your calculator if you start plugging things in. I'm going to just go ahead and show how we can isolate the general um, formula for the expression. So therefore, right, V, V, W, is going to equal the opposite of B, that's 2 delta X over TT plus or minus the square root of B squared, this expression squared here, which is 4 delta X squared over T total squared minus four times a, and a is the coefficient of the quadratic term. The coefficient of the quadratic, remember this is the unknown. The quadratic here is just one. The, uh, the coefficient's just one. So one times c, which is vwg squared. That's the constant term c, and that's a negative, right? Minus, there'd be a negative this, so I'm just gonna add it there, all over 2a, where 2a, the a, a coefficient again is just two, right? That's a right there, the coefficient of this. 
And if you see, right, that two is gonna cancel this two right here. And there's a four and a four here. So if you pull that four out, then you could take the square root of it. The square root of four would be two. So that's gonna cancel all of these right there. And we're gonna be left with VBW equals delta X over TT plus or minus the square root of delta X over TT, the quantity squared, plus VWG squared. And there is the possible solutions for this. And so it's it's interesting to note here that the velocity of the boat with respect to the water is uh, equal to uh, what the velocity would be, right? This is what the velocity would be if there was no water, plus or minus the square root of the sum of the squares of the velocity without water plus the velocity of the water. So it's kind of in, kind of an interesting result here. Um, if you go around and do a little research, you'll see if you if you try to solve for t here, it gives you an interesting result. If you try to solve for t, it will prove that the round trip time with water is always going to be greater than without water. That if you have a current and you try to make a round trip like this, it's always going to take more time to do it with the water than it would be without. Um, you obviously you go faster one way and slower one way, but the amount of time you you gain going downstream is less than the time you lose going upstream. And that's always true. Um, so we could evaluate this, right? Delta X is two kilometers over. Now the time is 50 minutes. We could put 50 minutes in there. We'd then be calculating kilometers per minute. We don't tend to use kilometers per minute. It's meters per second or kilometers per hour. So this 50 minutes, we could express it as five sixths of an hour, right? Five sixths of an hour plus or minus the square root of this same thing here, two kilometers over five sixths of an hour. The whole thing squared plus that velocity of the water, 1.4 kilometers an hour. squared. And we see that converting this to hours was the right choice because this is in kilometers per hour, right? Otherwise, we'd have to convert this into kilometers per minute or something like that. And so that becomes, that's going to be 12 fifths of a kilometer per hour plus or minus the square root of 12 fifths squared plus 1.4 squared. And they're both gonna be kilometers squared per hour squared, which when you square root it is gonna be just kilometers per hour. Um, so this could be solved exactly, but just go ahead and get a calculator out. It's probably easier. And what is this? 0.5. 
12 divided by 5 squared plus 1.4 squared. And we square root that whole thing, which is 7.72. And that comes out to be about 2.8. And then plus 12 fifths, which gives us 5.178 to two significant digits. It is 5.2 kilometers per hour. So that is the speed of the boat with respect to the water. If the water wasn't flowing, that would be the same as the speed of the boat with respect to the ground. But obviously it goes a little faster when it's going downstream because it picks up the speed of the water and it goes a little slower when it's going upstream because it loses the speed of the water. All right. Um, it's not a super complicated problem, but it can become difficult to follow everything along. But we see this sort of same pattern that comes up very frequently where we have two different types of equations for two different legs or two different parts of a journey. And then we don't know either of these individual times, but we know the sum of the times. And we see that we get this thing where we can insert a an expression for each of these individual times and eliminate these two unknowns, giving us one equation with one unknown, like we have uh, right here. All right, um, thank you so much.